live. This is Spears. Good afternoon. Welcome to the program. Coming to you live from Cairns this afternoon, a long way from Canberra and a whole lot warmer as well this time of year, mercifully. We'll come to all of uh, what's been going on, why we're here in Cairns in just a moment. Back in Canberra, of course, we've seen the government inch closer to another legislative win with confirmation today that the Foreign Fighters Bill, these temporary exclusion orders, will become a reality. Labor will be moving some amendments tonight, trying to point out the government's not reflecting the recommendations, all of the recommendations, of the Joint Standing Committee on Intelligence and Security. But the point from Labor today, and their caucus meeting has approved this approach, I'll move amendments, but if they're not successful, they're not going to stand in the way. They will allow these temporary exclusion orders to become a reality. The Prime Minister in his party room meeting today also had a pretty keen, or key message for the coalition backbenchers to pull their heads in. It's disrespectful, he suggested, to be speaking out on policy issues that are different to the government line. They should use the internal processes instead. He gave this message to them a couple of weeks ago. Clearly some didn't get the message. We've got some divisions on things from New Start, whether it should be increased nuclear power, whether we should have some in Australia and whether we should go ahead with the legislative increase in the superannuation guarantee as well. We'll come back to all of that. Why are we here in Cairns, though, today? Well, it's all part of the Strong Australia program we've been doing with the Business Council of Australia, working our way around some of the key regions in Australia to talk to local, small, medium and even bigger businesses in regional parts of Australia about the pressures they're facing, the challenges, but the opportunities as well. Here in Cairns, of course, the tourism industry is so important to the local economy. A lot of that revolves around the Great Barrier Reef just back there. There, of course, have been a lot of concerns here that over recent years, all the stories and talk about the reef dying have really impacted on tourism, impacted on the economy here as well. But that's not all. There's, as in many parts of Australia, a great demand for more infrastructure spending here too. To help with the agriculture in this region, around Cairns, get their produce into Asian markets. Now, I spoke, as I say, to a lot of the business leaders who came along for our uh, event here earlier today in Cairns and then sat down with Jennifer Westacott, the Chief Executive of the Business Council of Australia, and Nick Lucas, who is the President of the Cairns Chamber of Commerce. Jennifer, Nick, thanks very much for joining us here this afternoon. Wonderful to be here in Cairns in far north Queensland, tropical north Queensland. Look, I think one of the questions whenever we look at regional Queensland still is what happened in the election. Uh, Jennifer, what's your sense, having spent a bit of time here, about why we saw this result, one of Labor's worst results, certainly in this state, and so decisive in the overall outcome? Yeah, look, I think that the regions are the big story in, in the election, whether it's here, whether it's across the country, whether it's in Western Sydney. I think part of it, David, is, and you and I have been doing this for 18 months, getting around to the regions, I think people feel that the conversation that happens in inner city Melbourne and Sydney is not the conversation they want to hear. There's a real disconnect. There's a real disconnect. Um, the kind of anti-business agenda doesn't resonate with people in the regions because they say, we love business. We would love a big business to come here because it means we've got jobs, we've got a diversified economy, uh, the top end of town stuff. It just doesn't resonate with people in the regions because people are aspirational, to use that jargon. They want to get ahead. Uh, they don't want us to talk things down. And, they, and people here in Cairns, they know that without a strong business community, they can't succeed. So I, I think people just misread the regional sentiment at, that you and I were picking up as we were touring would, Australia. Do you, would you agree with that, Nick? Why, how would you explain what happened here? It's great, wasn't it? Um, yes, it Depends absolutely. where you sit politically, I guess. Well, look, when I'm any great, uh, great that we're getting heard. You're getting better. a louder voice. Yeah, a louder voice. Yeah. I think that's important. Look, absolutely. Um, we, we continually get the um, feeling in a business sense that um, mm. Brisbane's not hearing us, Canberra's not hearing us. Mm. Um, and this gave us a better voice and, you know, it's, it's made a lot politically stand up and listen better, which is good. Well, are they? This mm. is the thing. Uh, are you getting the love from either Brisbane or from Canberra in terms um, of what We've had a lot need? more visitors lately right. from Brisbane and Canberra. And, and um, they're, look, they're certainly listening. Um, I've got to give um, uh, Labor federally uh, a pat that... You know, um, Anthony Albanese has been, been up here. Uh, Anthony um, is coming, right. um, but we, we've had the Treasurer, the, the Deputy... Um, Richard Miles, the deputy leader, or the shadow treasurer, Jim shadow Chalmers. Shadow treasurer, Jim, Jim Chalmers. Chalmers. Right. We've, had, we've had Jim Chalmers up here, yep. um, well, and he was listening. Yep, good Queenslander. And what would you? Um, what, what's the message from business here to federal labour? Look, I, I think similar to what Jennifer said is the anti-business sentiment just went down really bad here. Right. Um, you know, we, so labour's seen as anti-business. 
Um, no, no, I don't necessarily mean that, but I think some of the discussion that Shorten as a leader was, was interpreted as anti-business. Um, we're pleased to see that Anthony Albanese, the new leaders, come out and, and embrace business a bit more, and we think that's important and it's a good step for Labor to, to maybe mend some of that anti-business um, uh, sentiment in the regions. Well, we'll come back to the discussion around infrastructure, because that, in every region, but certainly here in far north Queensland, very important as well uh, for some of the economic need. But one of the impressions that, I, that I've picked up here is that, I mean, tourism is so fundamental to this economy, um, but there's a bit of anger that, well, everyone thinks the Great Barrier Reef is dying or dead, and what's the point of coming here to see it? Uh, that is certainly a perception, um, you know, in other parts of Australia and other parts of the world, I'm sure, but is it the reality? What's the reef like now, and how worried are local businesses about the perception of how bad it is? Look, I think it's our number one issue at the moment. Um, the reef is certainly in no way dead. It's actually uh, thriving. Yes, we had some damage. No one's denying that there was some damage. But we're seeing amazing regrowth in areas. And um, people going out now and say it's never looked any better. The reef is alive. We have the best managed reef in the world. That is undeniable. Um, and people coming and seeing it, and I know Jennifer's had the opportunity to see it, it is magnificent. And we've unfortunately not done a good enough job at um, answering the fake news and say, hey, it's not dead. There's been some damage, but we still have the best managed reef and the best reef in the world. How important do you think that message is, Jennifer, for this oh, local it's hugely economy? important. You can't have people in Europe saying, I don't want to go to the Barrier Reef because I won't see anything. Because the, the truth of the matter is you will see a lot. I mean, I, I was out there the other day and it was amazing. Um, you can't have people saying it's dead. It's not. Is it, has it got precious? Well, yes, it has. Um, but, but to Nick's point, it's incredibly well managed. I mean, the fishery changes have been incredible. I mean, I went fishing, caught a lot of fish. Um, and, you know, I think we've got to be careful that we get the scientists' uh, advice and that, 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 that we kind of embed that but into the But that's the thing, you can't hide the truth, you can't hide the reality of what's going on. But we, but we can't have that, uh, we can't have it as fake news either that it's mm. dead. We can't have it that it's a catastrophe. It, it is a very serious issue that we have to manage as a country. Um, but the idea that we're sort of almost kind of cutting off our nose to spite our face by saying that, we deter people from coming, which of course has this economic effect, which means we don't have enough money to reinvest in making sure it stays healthy. And this is an asset we have to preserve, not just for Australians, but for the world. Well, Nick, let me ask you, how much is the health of the reef tied to climate change, do you believe? Look, there's, there's no doubt we can do more in regard to climate change and health of the reef. Mm. It is an ongoing thing forever. But we need to manage that asset a bit better than we have been. Unfortunately, I think some of the uh, fake news that the climate change has been... Great Barrier Reef's been used as a tool to say, we've killed the Great Barrier Reef because of climate change, which, which has really hurt our, us as a business, our region, big time. Um, so can we do better at managing the reef? Absolutely. But is the damage that has been done because of climate change? Look, I, I'm not a scientist, um, but I, I think that's had an impact. But we're seeing wonderful... Um, uh, regeneration of some of those areas that have. We've had um, crown of thorn starfish for many years, which has been managed well. Um, there'll be something else, um, but we just need to make sure we continue to be the best managed Look, reef the, in the world. Look, the reef is critical to the economy here. Infrastructure is critical to the economy here. And look, in so many regional parts of Australia as well, whether we're talking about uh, you know, better highways, better road access to ports and airports, better freight corridors and so on. Um, look, what are the pressures like at the moment in, um, in a place like Cairns and in this region of far north Queensland when it comes to infrastructure? Look, first of all, we've had underspend of approximately a billion dollars over the last five years in regard to infrastructure. From the state or the federal government? Look, from the state and the federal, but uh, we're mainly talking state infrastructure now. And that doesn't take into account that ABS statistics underestimate that population, so it's actually worse than that. Right. Um, and we're talking about roads, dams... Correct. What are we talking about yeah. there? But what, we've got the Northern Australia um, policy. We've got all these things. The Northern Australia wanted, infrastructure. Infrastru right. yeah. Well, not even that, just the, the growing Northern Australia right. as, as, as a federal policy. But we're not seeing any action in there. We need water. So we need Nalinga Dam. We need better infrastructure, um, uh, investment in roads. We've got so many business opportunities here, agricultural, tourism, all that. But we're not seeing you know, a billion dollars over five years. Now, that might, that might sound a lot for an area like Capital City. That's a, a huge amount for us here. Um, so we have to reverse that trend. Um, and we're also playing catch-up. 
Well, the statistic that's so often used, but always uh, gets me anyway, is that Cairns is further away from Brisbane than Melbourne is from Brisbane, right? You're, you're a long way north here. <laughs> Jennifer, does that mean there's a particular... Uh, need for infrastructure spending when you're that removed from the capital cities. Absolutely, and when you're that important as a gateway to the rest of the world, particularly mm. to Asia, uh, for security reasons, for tourism, for the economy, we, we do have to change our mindset about um, how we make decisions about infrastructure prioritisation. Um, we've got to start getting that regional focus. We've got to start thinking about building a nation not just building two cities, as important as all of the infrastructure needs in Sydney and Melbourne are. And we've got to get Infrastructure Australia to focus on what is it going to take for a city like Cairns to really perform at that global level, because that's where the competition is. Mm. And what are the bits of infrastructure that are going to get agriculture down from the tablelands onto a plane into those Asian markets mm. at premium prices? Well, it's pretty clear what, what's needed uh, in terms of which projects yeah. uh, the local businesses want. Yeah. It's a question of getting the money to pay sure. for Sure. I mean, th th there's a couple of ways of doing that, though. One, one is, I mean, there is a lot of money spent in infrastructure in Australia. The idea that we don't spend any is simply not true. I mean, in Western mm. Sydney, is like $20 billion being spent uh, alone. It's about prioritisation, David. It's about saying, look, we're going to put this project on the top list of priorities we know that we've got quite a lot of money and we're not going to divert from that as a project. That's so are you I saying think. enough is being spent on no, infrastructure? No, I, I, I don't believe so. But there's always going to be an argument about, you know, how long is a piece of string. Mm. What, what I think we have to do is stop chopping and changing. We have to get some serious national and state priorities. And that, that will also allow the private sector to say, OK, um, government wants this project to happen, the community wants this project to happen, Businesses are pretty good at saying, actually, a better way of financing this would be X or Y. Um, but this idea of the absence of this sense of the prioritisation of the list, if you will, mm. linked to an economic strategy for the broader region. I mean, it can't just be a list of projects that sit without context. But we are often talking about government money, taxpayers' <coughs> money, sure. be it state or federal, when, when we talk about roads and rail and ports and dams and so on. Um, and there, there are many who say, right now, really cheap to borrow, never been cheaper government should be borrowing more to invest in infrastructure. I mean, for, yeah. at the local level here, would you agree with that? You'd like to see governments tip in a bit more right now? Look, absolutely. You can't, the other thing is you can't use the same metrics for investment in infrastructure in regionals you can in the cities. This, some of this thing is nation-building type, you know, the, the dam, um, the Linga Dam. Um, looking at a return for taxpayers' money, it can't be looked at the same as in a capital city. And unfortunately, that has held back some of those bigger you know, nation-building type um, mm -hmm. projects. Well, if you can get you know, freight mm -hmm. uh, into those markets in Asia, Hong Kong and so on, mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be far more important in a region like this for the agriculture in a region Absolutely. like this than yep. uh, adding another flight out of Sydney or Melbourne. But, but Jennifer, when we talk about spending more on infrastructure, investing more on in infrastructure right now, where do you sit on whether the government should be protecting this surplus that's forecast for this financial year, or should it be prepared to spend a bit more and put that at risk? I think, that, first of all, there are lots of ways of doing infrastructure financing and funding. You know, mm -hmm. So, you know, it doesn't all have to come out of government. I mean, the world has, you know, Australia has the lowest in interest rates in history. Uh, we're awash with capital. The challenge is to give companies projects that they are certain government is going to take the risk out of through environmental approvals, through mm. corridor preservation and so on. So that's one, th one point. Look, I, I don't think the government should give up on the surplus. I think the surplus has been very hard fought, very hard won. And, you know, we've got to remember that what we need is to get the economy to grow faster. We don't need a stimulus like we did in 2008. We need to get the fundamentals to get the economy to grow faster. And that's things like getting businesses to invest, which goes back to taxation. So if we're not going to do company tax, let's give a broad-based investment allowance to encourage companies to bring forward their investments. So That's they could do more on that? They could do a lot more absolutely. on that. We could do a lot more on the skills agenda to get people ready for the changes that are happening to increase our productivity. Right. We could do a lot more on deregulating the economy, getting rid of the red tape, the ridiculous kind of differences in shopping hours across the country that are kind of making it hard for Australian retailers to compete. These are really basic things. That's what, what we need is reform, not cash splashes. That's not the salute. We're not in the 2008 situation. We're in a situation where we've got a hard-won, hard-fought surplus. 
We should preserve it, but we should do the reform to make the economy grow faster. Well, you're a supporter of increasing the new start allowance as yep. well. Is that should that be seen in the context of stimulus, or is that just a fairness thing? I think that's just a, a, a fairness thing. And I think we've got to remember there are 23,000 people on Newstart who've been on it for 10 years. Uh, now, of course, the best, uh, the best recipe is to get people a job. But if people are in a state of real poverty and they, they can't afford the clothes to go to an interview, their health deteriorates, they're evicted from their house, they've got no capacity to kind of pick themselves up, that's not going to get them back into the workforce. So, you know, these things have got to be considered as part of budgets, uh, not as one-off strategy so you get the fiscal stuff right. But, you know, I'd be very concerned if we sort of said, look, it doesn't matter about the surplus. It matters enormously because people forget when, when the GFC happened, we had a pretty big surplus. It saved us as well as kind of a well-regulated banking system. Let's, let's be very careful about that decision. Let, well, a bit longer term, but one of the things the economy needs is wages to start growing mm. um, and you know, for business to do that, they obviously want a bit more economic uh, activity to be able to do that. But let me just, while we're here, get your thoughts on the debate over the superannuation guarantee. Do you think it should be going up to 12% or is it better to try and get that money into workers' pockets well, I think the government's now. committed today. The finance minister's made a comment today that he's not changing the timetable. No, what do you think? Look, I think you've got to think through this very carefully. We've always argued that you need a proper inquiry into the superannuation and retirement right. income system. Because what we keep doing is we tinker with one bit and, of course, cause a problem somewhere else. And the Productivity Commission, I think, has made the same point. So we, we should be doing that. I think the question we have to ask is, in an economy where wages are not growing as fast as we want them, to take another 3% of people's wages in a compulsory super scheme that the Productivity Commission says is not very well run, uh, you know, I think we should think it through. Better off trying to get that money in the workers' pockets now. Well, I, and, and, and that's, not about, that's not just about super. That's about the sort of things I've just talked about. You know, you have got to get companies to, re to invest. And to invest, they've got to have better rates of return. And we've got to do something about the skills agenda. You know, our TAFE system, our VET system, which you and I have talked about many times, we've got to get people skills so they can get access to those good jobs. Yeah, well, what do you think as a local employer about this debate? How do you get wages growth in a, in a place like Cairns? What's stopping local employers paying more? Well, first of all, I want to talk about the inequality between government jobs and private sector. That's a major issue mm. here. Right. And, and the drain of um, jobs from private enterprise to government organisation is, is, is So you, you really feel that? Yeah, absolutely. Here. So where are they absolutely. going into uh, health and yeah, education health, work? Queensland and health, education, council right. as well. And you're um, competing and against those wages? Absolutely. And of course, we, you, you want people to earn as much as they possibly mm. can. But we have different um, constraints. In, you know, we have to have a return. Um, so that's a major issue regionally and, and probably also in the capital cities. Um, the, trying to get skilled labour where they're all taken up um, in government jobs, in, in my area, which is pharmacy, um, is an issue. Mm. But what's the main thing that's... So that, but is that stopping you increasing wages? Not just you specifically, but I'm yep. talking about employers generally uh, in, a, in a region like this. Is it... Because I would imagine the competition with the public sector mm. would only push up wages, wouldn't it? Yeah, look, it'll push up wages, but you've still got to be profitable. So the, cons the constraints, you can only increase the wages to a certain point. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what has been happening, and, and, and you know, even if we start touching on payroll tax, mm -hmm. is there's disincentives for employment because to get the overall wages at a, a sustainable level, you're employing less people. Well, this, and finally, uh, brings us to the question of how you do grow uh, an economy like this one. And the one thing that's come up here with everyone that we've been speaking to today has been population yep. as well. Uh, population growth used to be about 4% here. It's now roughly 1% or a little over 1%. Um, we've seen the government try and rein in population growth nationally, but try and divert more migrants to regional areas. What's your message to Canberra, to the federal government, about population growth? Sure. Well, first of all, we want to see an immigration strategy for the regions in our area. Um, you haven't seen that yet? N not really. So what is being happening quite commonly now is they're using a regional migration as a stepping stone mm -hmm. to get to the capital city. There needs to be other uh, longer 
requirements for them to stay in the area, tax mm. benefits. Um, more um, when, they're, when they're looking for who's going to move here, that they want to stay in the region, not mm. just a stepping stone. If they've got family in Capital City and they only have to be in Cairns for two years, of course they're going to be here for two years and then move. Um, so the incentives need to be better for people to stay here, develop businesses, um, and a thriving economy obviously helps that. Yeah, and Jennifer, you know, we see it uh, time and again. The debate in Sydney and Melbourne, understandably, is about the population pressures, but in the regions, a very different story. Absolutely. We've just got to change a couple of these conversations. We've got to change the conversation to, you know, how do we get people to come and stay in these regions? How do we make it attractive? How do we get the economic activity? But we should never forget, people create economic activity, particularly in a services economy. People create lots of economic activity. And we do need, as Nick says, a kind of comprehensive regional strategy that says, how are we going to encourage people to go to these key areas like Cairns? And how do we put the infrastructure, the services, the education system in place to keep them there and give them a good life? Jennifer Westacott, CEO of the Business Council of Australia. Nick Lucas, the President of the Cairns Chamber of Commerce. Thanks both very much for joining me this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks very much. This program has been brought to you by the Business Council of Australia. Authorised by Jay Clark, Business Council of Australia, Melbourne.